Today we're going to talk about the Arthritis Advisory Committee meeting held on August the 3rd, wherein the FDA considered the approval of tofacitinib for psoriatic arthritis. I'm joined today by Dr. Alan Gabowski, Professor of Medicine at Hospital for Special Surgery in New York and Wild Cornell Medicine. Alan is a past chair of the Arthritis Advisory Committee, sat in on the Arthritis Advisory Committees for many years, and has a lot of experience with these kind of proceedings. I've asked him to come on and answer five questions about this particular hearing. Alan, welcome. Thank you, Jack. Good to be with you tonight. So first, I want your impression on the outcome of the meeting, where it was a 12, uh, 11 to, sorry, 10 to 1 unanimous vote in favor of, almost unanimous vote, in favor of the approval of tofacitinib based on these two trials in psoriatic arthritis. So, Jack, the mission of the FDA is to review drugs that are brought to them by manufacturers because of their efficacy in a particular condition based against the safety in that condition as well as others in which it was studied. Given that, I think that the committee did its job by looking at that appropriate ratio and coming to the conclusion that the efficacy was appropriate in this condition without any different safety concerns other than those that we've already been seeing for the last couple of years with the use of this drug that are acceptable and manageable. And that led to the overwhelming recommendation to the agency for approval. This was in many ways a fairly easy um, hearing where the efficacy, efficacy data was consistent. Uh, there was efficacy as far as ACR20, but also in dactylitis and enthesitis. The real issue that for discussion was the x-ray study. They had one 52-week um, uh, study that looked at x-ray outcomes, and the uh, sponsor said that this trial wasn't really powered for a radiographic indication, that they basically did the study to prove that patients who were improving clinically weren't worsening radiographically. And in fact, that's what they did prove, that they were not better than placebo. The problem being, of course, that the placebo group didn't progress very far, almost nothing, in fact. So what's going to happen here is they're going to get a clinical indication, but not a radiographic indication. And because they failed on that, the argument was whether or not it should be in the label. What's your take on that part of the study or what was presented? Well, Jack, overall, when we deal with our diseases, we tend to keep in mind that there are three domains of efficacy we're looking for. We're looking certainly for relief of signs and symptoms. We're looking certainly for inhibition of patient reported outcomes. And we're also looking for inhibition of structural progression. Now, in fairness, our patients come to us with signs and symptoms. Our patients come to us complaining of inability to engage in their activities of daily living, but no one has ever come to me, and I doubt to you, complaining of x-ray progression. That's simply not something that patients are as concerned about as we are in defining whether or not an agent is merely relieving symptoms or modifying the disease. So I think in this particular instance, there was a recognition that although the x-ray data was incomplete for labeling purposes, it was still acceptable enough to allow for the label to indicate that there was appropriate relief of signs and symptoms and appropriate improvement in patient report outcomes, such that the labeling or not becomes less important to the clinician and less important to the patient as well. So one of the good things about this particular study was that in all the safety data that they did accrue on almost 800 patients uh, in these two trials really mirrored uh, what we saw in rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, some of the data actually looked better as far as, for instance, uh, SIE risks or even zoster events and whatnot. But the same profile was seen with uh, the psoriatic arthritis patients as was seen in RA. Does that help um, doctors in, in this new indication or is, it, is that a plus for the sponsor? Uh, both. You'll remember, Jack, that um, the sponsor had previously sought to use this drug in psoriasis 
And that application didn't go that well and was ultimately withdrawn because of concerns, not about efficacy, but concerns about safety. Now, there was a real issue whether in psoriatic arthritis, which can be viewed as a clinical phenotype of psoriasis, if you will, one would see the safety concerns that dogged the psoriasis study or the lack of safety concerns that dogs the arthritis study. In this particular instance, what we saw was that there was not the problem with psoriasis. There were the same issues with relationship to the arthritis. And that, I think, gives us some reassurance in a roundabout way that these people who have both skin and joint manifestations, though not necessarily at the same time, are not going to see any significant increased signal because of their skin while they're being treated for their joints. So this potential psoriatic arthritis approval, um, will it have an effect on patients with um, psoriasis or expectations for those who may be treating psoriasis? As you mentioned, the uh, application was withdrawn after they had received the complete response letter. Uh, and most of that was, uh, I believe, based on failure to get um, a good response with five milligrams BID. It was only the 10 milligrams BID uh, uh, dose that did that were seemed to work, and then there were other issues, as you alluded to. But the question is, could this be viewed as tacit approval for the drug to be used in skin disease, where you think that this will be the drug for rheumatologists and not at all for dermatologists? Oh, I definitely think this will be the drug for rheumatologists and not for dermatologists. I think dermatologists are just beginning to recognize that not all joint pain in psoriasis is psoriatic arthritis, and that's why we see referrals from them. I don't think that they're going to be as keen in treating the skin disease as we are in treating the joint disease. Now, when we're treating the joint disease, we will pay attention to the skin, but uh, when they're treating the skin disease, I don't know how much they pay attention to the joints. So I don't see this being used for um, psoriasis by dermatologists as much as I see it being used for psoriatic arthritis by us rheumatologists. I agree. So the last question goes to the issue, do we need another drug for psoriatic arthritis or psoriatic disease? We have five TNF inhibitors. We have now uh, two small molecule drugs in first aprimolast and now possibly tofacitinib. We have two and maybe three IL-17 inhibitors, do we really need all these drugs? And what do you see happening going forth? Well, Jack, I guess I do see the need for this agent because it is a different class, a representative of a different class of agents. And I see the need for newer agents of different classes more than I see the need for additional agents in the same class. If this were a 6-TNF inhibitor, you and I would probably not be having this discussion. Um, if this were the 18th non-steroidal, you and I would not be having this discussion. I think it's because it is the first agent of a different mechanism of action that the agency was willing to look at this indication for psoriatic arthritis even after the withdrawal of the indication for psoriasis because this is a different mechanism of action and as such affords additional therapeutic benefit to those individuals who have not responded to those mechanisms of action that we have so far. Alan, I always revere your opinion, never more so than now when I can look at you on camera and see a halo over your head. Well, thank you, Jack. There's a, a halo of sorts over your head as well, although from my perspective, it almost looks like uh, Aggie horns. So whatever you're intending to do, you've done it. Yes. Uh, that was that Aggies? No, that's Texas. All right. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Jack.